Assalamualaikum, ladies and gentlemen. We have done with the keynotes and the plenary speakers. Now, let us move on to our final agenda before the closing ceremony. We will have a forum entitled Integrated STEM Education, Issues and Challenge. Today, we will have three panelists and one moderator. The first panelist is Associate Professor Dr. Rachel Sheffield from Curtin University, Australia. Second is Assistant Professor Dr. Choi Ban Hang from National Institute of Education, Singapore. And the third one is Dr. Kesara Amon from Simeo STEM Education, Thailand. Along with a moderator, Professor Datuk Dr. Noraini Binti Idris, Adjunct Professor in UMT and President of National STEM Association, Malaysia. The stage is yours, Datuk. Our uh, MC today, uh, Assalamualaikum and a very happy afternoon to all our panelists and of course uh, our keen and excited audience to hear how we can integrate STEM, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. And um, normally we mention uh, the word STEM regularly but in the classroom we teach separately the science, uh, the technology, the engineering, the mathematics as a subject individually. So today for this forum, uh, we were able to discuss and explore, should we integrate and why we should integrate and how we should integrate. So today our panelists from uh, Singapore, Thailand and Australia will share with us the issue, challenges and best practices. Without further delay, I would like to invite our first panelist, that is uh, Associate Professor Dr. Rachel Sheffield from Curtin University, Australia. Pass to you. Thank you and good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm just going to share my slides. Yes, please. You can see those now? Not yet. Hopefully you can. It's saying it's sharing them now. Yes, yes, we see that. Excellent. Okay, thank you. So um, thank you very much. It's, it's an honor to talk to you. And I know we were just talking about students. I've actually left a class of students to come and speak with you. So uh, um, it's a very much a, a very interesting uh, topic and I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I think the first thing we have to, to talk about um, is what we, what we are all talking about when we're talking about STEM education. I think the other thing is we need to be very clear on why it's important, because if we want to integrate just for, purely for integration's sake, then I think it's a lot of energy and effort for teachers in classrooms. So we need to know why it's important. And then uh, we need to look at the challenges and issues and we'll address some of them um, in uh, an Australian context. And, um, and then we look at how we can teach it in a classroom setting. So I thought that was something, um, and all the photos I, I add, this is from uh, our STEMinists, which is uh, women in STEM. Uh, we have a STEMinist community and the photos are, are from, uh, from that, that, uh, that program, even the Wigglebot here on the, on the right hand side. So I think the first thing we need to start off is what is STEM? Now at, at its narrowest, we're talking about completely integrated STEM technology, engineering and mathematics. And in Australia, it's problematic that term. We don't actually have engineering in our curriculum. So we need to be very thoughtful about what we want it to be. So I work on this premise. I, I talk about the deliberate full or partial integration of any or all of the key components. So I'm really clear that, it, and I'm including not just content knowledge, but skills. So those are the two things I'm really interested in. I don't want to force it into all four areas. I think that does, does a disservice to what we're trying to teach. And I think the skills are, are really, really important. 
and that and that comes to us in why. Now we talked just now. I heard you talk uh, to uh, my colleague in Singapore about COVID. Australia, especially West Australia, has no active cases of COVID. We're extremely lucky. We have no um, no lockdown. However, we're still progressing with vaccination. But you know, one of the most important things that COVID has done has been to really highlight STEM. Because if you look at this picture um, on your screen, it is very much around science, mathematics, engineering, and technology. We're using, so the top screen is the John Hopkins data, um, gathered that big data analytics around cases of STEM. Um, we're talking about using mathematical modeling. To, we're talking about the science of the, the uh, virus itself, and there's an electron micrograph of the virus, as well as successful PPE, which is what's also illustrated. I don't think there's been a time in my lifetime where there's been so much discussion around STEM, around how the virus is transmitted, around who gets sick and who's protected, about how the vaccines, the different vaccines work. It's been terrible to have to have that conversation but it's been amazing to see it in our community and i would like to say to you this is one of the reasons that this is we have to keep persevering teaching stem and teaching it in an integrated way because when the mathematics uh, the mathematicians are modeling the mathematics they don't say I can't do any more. They actually go in and talk to the scientists and say, tell me what you know. Tell me how, what's the efficacy of that particular version of the vaccine that you're creating. So it's a very, very lovely, but terribly, terribly sad situation that we find ourselves in. For me, before even before COVID, I think that STEM is important for its skill sets and I, I put to you I think that we use STEM very much around the transversal competencies to teach collaboration, communication, critical thinking and creativity. So I'm very very much in that, uh, that, that way of thinking and then when I teach STEM to my students in the tertiary space I'm focused not just on the content knowledge, but also on these skills. I'm muted. Wider than that, um, we're expanding it a little bit. Um, these are the transversal competencies from UNESCO. I don't know if they're familiar to you. Um, in Australia, we have um, our own general capabilities, which we use to inform on the production of the UNESCO transversal competencies. And we see all this language coming in, especially for teachers in primary and secondary classrooms, that this language is really important. We need to teach students to be thoughtful, to be good decision makers to have teamwork, to, to demonstrate empathy as well as collegiality. We need to have interpersonal um, skills, so perseverance, intrapersonal, sorry, perseverance, compassion, integration, uh, integrity and risk taking, and then the notion of being a global citizen. And, and as we're in a pandemic together, there's no bigger um, situation than having um, a, a, a students understand the importance of being a citizen of the world. So I think these are what I really focus on when I'm thinking about uh, STEM. And I think these are why um, STEM is incredibly important. Um, this is... Um, Another of uh, our STEMinist work. So there's a pre-service teacher. These guys are building a a, a, um, a pipeline, and it's an engineering activity for them in the classroom, based on their co uh, cooperation and collaboration together. So there's a mixture of communication to achieve their task, and uh, and so if we think it's important, and I think we 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 do think it's important then what are the challenges and how do we overcome them? Well, the challenges are numerous and I'm sure that they're probably the same and I'm interested to see what my colleague in Singapore and in Thailand say about this. But for me, the challenges 
in schools um, is about making it relevant. I think the old days are gone when we can teach um, things that are compartmentalized, uh, they're not related to context, and students can't see purpose and value in them. So I think uh, relevance is really important. I think we have a very overcrowded curriculum, and therefore it becomes very much about racing through content. And that is a real challenge for teachers, especially in secondary classrooms. We also have the silo approach to subjects and also to assessment. And the problem with assessment too, is that skills and competencies are difficult to assess. It is much easier to, to assess content knowledge in science, it's right, it's wrong, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a formula we use. It's much more different and difficult to finesse the um, changes in behavior that comes around demonstrating good um, collaboration or communication skills. We, as I said, in Australia have an issue with E. So we call it, um, we don't have engineering uh, per se, we do have inquiry. So where does the E fit? Uh, and then there's the normal um, fighting about the inclusion of A for art, M for medicine, R for reading, and then we don't just get a stem with leaves, we, we get a tree with roots and everything else. It gets complicated. And in Australia too, we've had a reduced number of students engaging in STEM subjects. And I wonder if that's the consequence to the fact that they don't see it as relevant, they have the overcrowded curriculum um, and the silo approach. And if they, we did it differently in schools, then maybe students would feel more engaged and more interested to participate. So that's particularly in secondary classrooms. And I don't know if that's changed with COVID. As I said, so that's something we haven't looked at. Uh, one of my colleagues put this together and I really, really liked it because she talks about, she was an engineer, and she talks about the connectedness of how science and maths provide the background. Engineering is about design fluency and design creation. And then technology is about putting it into action. But right in the middle sits the values, needs, and the economy of society. And when that is overwhelmingly, as it is in COVID, in, it's very driven, it's driving very strongly the rest of this circle in, in the science, the maths, the engineering and the technology. So I, I think it's a very, um, a very holistic, someone's used the word holistic, I really like it, very holistic way of looking at how um, they fit together. So I think people are saying to me, okay, well, you've talked about it, what does it actually look like? And there's two ways that I particularly like doing it. I do it from a problem-based approach and I use a project-based approach. With the problem-based approach, I'm using um, something like the Hasner Platinum model, which is around design thinking and gives students a nice, rich, wicked, real-world problem to solve. And they use that problem to do a design focus. They bring in their science and their content and they investigate what they need to find out. Who are the end users? Who, who are we solving the problem for? And then we um, are coming up with solutions. So we, I do that and, and we use, as I said, the um, problem-based learning models. And the other way, is the project-based learning uh, and then I, I create maker spaces. I create maker spaces for my students here at, at university and we look at skills focus and so we'll teach uh, creativity and we will look at how we might do that in a classroom for a group of primary students. So I do actually do this um, with my work with my students um, but before I sound too amazing, but I don't get to do it in mainstream. I have to teach these as my options units. But in that saying that, they're one of the most popular options units that run. There's two that run, and they are incredibly popular because students really enjoy getting into trying to design wicked uh, solutions for wicked problems, and they really enjoy working creative, uh, creatively in a maker space 
with the project-based learning. So this was, we worked, we've worked in Indonesia, we've worked in Malaysia, this is some of our work in, in, in India as well. Um, these are, are some of our STEMINIST community making a whole range of activities uh, in the maker spaces. So that was some of the work that we've been doing. So I think I'll probably stop there because I know I only have 10 minutes and I don't want to overstay my um, welcome. And I know I have uh, colleagues to, uh, to, to to draw on for their for their conversations as well. So Thank I don't you. know if you want to uh, you. do questions afterwards. No, or uh, uh, yeah, we'll do the question after all the three panelists as uh, shared, yeah? Thank yeah. you very much. Uh, very ex excellent, very inspiring. And yes, uh, we, we are looking forward for more ideas and then to collaborate further. So without further ado, I would like to invite our second panelist, Associate uh, Professor Dr. Choi Ban Heng from National Institute of Education, Singapore. Pass to you, Prof. Hi, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Right. So I, I'm just going to build on uh, Rachel's uh, point about the STEM and the importance of STEM. So I, I shall not repeat it because I think everybody agrees that STEM is important and uh, it's definitely relevant uh, for uh, today's world. So I thought I, I would really uh, start by highlighting three challenges uh, of integrated STEM. And of course, the first thing is what to teach. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's what all teachers uh, will be asking, you know, what's the content? And here, I think we have, you know, uh, two extremes. On one hand, we want to think about the disciplinary aspect of STEM. Now, it is important still to recognize that science, mathematics, engineering, and technology are four different disciplines. Each of them have their own disciplinary traditions. There is still value in each of the disciplines. And each of the disciplines provide a different perspective of the world. And so I think one of the things that many teachers struggle with is, you know, how much of the disciplinary traditions do I need to convey in integrated STEM? And it, it, it is an interesting question which demands some form of answers. Like for example, in mathematics, there's still uh, some importance in uh, being able, you know, to, to solve equations because that's like a basic skill in, in uh, mathematics. Uh, and without the ability to solve equations uh, and, or even to think about equations or to even understand equations, it is difficult for them to model the real world. So on one hand, you have this disciplinary uh, issue. On the other hand, you also have transdisciplinary skills to teach, you know, uh, or even competencies, like what was mentioned, collaboration, communication. These are transdisciplinary competencies and these are important ones. Critical thinking or even creative thinking. Uh, in, in Singapore, we call it, you know, creative and inventive thinking. So, so you know, there's the aspect of that design or engineering element in it. So how to strike the balance? Because eventually we need both. You know, we, we need to have some form of deep disciplinary understanding and at the same time, the ability to have some of these transdisciplinary competencies. And so that's the first challenge, content. The second challenge is really something to do with this idea of integration. And we talk about integration, what makes STEM integrated? Or what do we mean by integrated STEM? Definitely, we are not talking about S, T, E, and M separately. And so the, the, the key thing here is connections. I think if there's one word that we can use to kind of characterize integrated STEM, that will be connections. And when we talk about connections, there's, a, there's at least two levels that we can look at. One is within the discipline, because within the discipline itself, there are connections between different topics. And teachers are already struggling with making connections within the discipline. Uh, and that's why sometimes, you know, I think students find STEM subjects or STEM disciplines very dry because they, they don't see the, the connections 
um, between the different topics. They see them as silos of knowledge. Uh, you know, today I'm doing algebra, tomorrow I'm doing calculus, but you know, there's no connections between them. And also connections between discipline, which is important. Because between science and mathematics, there are, there, there are connections. You know, and I, I like uh, what Rachel shared just now, you know, uh, the connections between science, mathematics and engineering or design thinking. You know, that, that, that whole connections between the different disciplines is something that needs to be emphasized. And I think that's what brings out the relevance. So it's not about do we emphasize connections within the discipline or do we emphasize the connections between disciplines? Again, it is about both. And I think that's the challenge, you know. And the third challenge is competencies. And now we are getting a little bit personal. And now we are getting into the competencies or mindsets uh, that we need. Teachers, all of us, what kind of competencies do we need? What kind of mindsets do we need? I was listening to the computational thinking uh, lecture just now, you know, and uh, it was very inspiring, you know, we all want to, to, to inculcate computational thinking in our students. But what does it mean for teachers? Does it mean that we have to pick up uh, computational thinking ourselves? Uh, do we need to learn how to code, you know, do coding? Uh, are we supposed to pick up any programming language? And I think here is uh, something that we need to bear in mind. Some, some people thought of teachers as a Da Vinci teacher. I don't know whether you know what I mean by a Da Vinci teacher. You know, Da Vinci is a uh, is one of those very famous, uh, you know, uh, scientists. You can call him a scientist. You can call him an artist. He's like a Renaissance man. You know, he he's good in everything. You know, he is also a mathematician, by the way. But very few of us are Da Vinci teachers because we don't have all the expertise. In fact. If you ask me, I mean, I'm, I'm trained in mathematics and science, but I'm more comfortable with mathematics. And if you ask me to do engineering stuff, I probably won't be comfortable. So it's not about having a Da Vinci teacher, but rather a teacher who is able to collaborate with others. So it is about a shift in mindset that, you know, my classroom is not my own anymore. Now I may have to even consider the possibility of co-teaching. And uh, in reality, uh, this is something that is worth thinking about. Teachers need to have a shift in mindset. We need to realize that our classroom is no longer private. We have to learn how to collaborate with one another. And we have, be, we have to also adopt the mindset that we are able to see connections between subjects and within the subjects. And, and this idea may, may be related to the whole notion of horizon content knowledge. Uh, but we also need to deal with ambiguity because now things are no longer the same. You know, things keep changing. And uh, do, do we have that kind of mindset? But students also have issues, right? And because students are used to, I don't know about other countries, but in Singapore, students are very used to the traditional form of teaching. And when you do something different, they will say, is there something wrong with my teacher today? You know, uh, or, or did my, my teacher work out on the wrong side of the bed, you know. Uh, and so students also have to learn to be able to see connections. They have different expectations. They, they need to develop habits of mind in order to, to view some of these uh, uh, challenges. So I think these, these three challenges are, are not easy. And I think this is uh, something that is worth thinking about. I don't think there's, a, again, a, a one-size-fits-all answer. We, we do have some ideas uh, which we invite, you know, our participants to think about and perhaps we, we can have discussion around this. So my colleagues and I, we kind of uh, have uh, developed, uh, you know, a framework to help teachers to think about integration. And uh, so I'm going to offer three ideas here very briefly. First, again, they're similar to what uh, Rachel has uh, highlighted, uh, a problem-based uh, learning and uh, project-based learning. And this is what we call a problem-centric integrated STEM instructional framework. In other words, the, the center of uh, the integration is problem. Find a nice problem. Find a wicked problem, something that requires students to, to, to work on together. In fact, it would be even better if we can get students to pose their own problem. 
because problem posing is, is actually a very important skill. So sometimes we, we leave the problem open. We, we say, okay, we are now designing uh, an, a village for the elderly. Now you choose your own problem. Which aspect of uh, you know, designing a village for elderly do we want to explore? Is it about the traffic crossing? Is it about the amenities? Is it about you know certain devices uh, that we need to put in the house so that you know when they need help they can they can get some help uh, or or what you know so I think it's important to to think about that and what we are trying to do in this framework is to frame the problem solving process so if you look at the outer ring uh, that's the problem solving process and and the lines that indicate the the level of uh, connections. So by, by using this framework, we can get teachers to start thinking about the connections between the STE and M as well as the problem itself. But the problem-centric approach is often difficult for many teachers because, you know, uh, it's, it's very open. So one other approach that we have tried is this idea of a solution-centric approach. In other words, we start with the solution. What's the existing solution? Then we ask, can we make the solution better? And this basically engages the students in a series of design thinking processes with in, in terms of innovating and improving the design of current solution. And through the design and improving of uh, current solution, we can actually uh, emphasize the connections between the four disciplines. Last but not least, which is very important, is the human-centric or the user-centric way of integrating STEM. In other words, we start from the user, who is our end user, and then find out from the end user, you know, what kind of design is needed? What kind of needs does the user have? You know, uh, what kind of problems, you know, do, do they have? And we kind of specify the requirements and then produce the design solutions. And through this whole process, uh, put human at the center of of the design thinking process. So by, by thinking about the, the center of the instructional framework, we can then kind of offer at least three different ideas of doing integrated STEM. And I think I'm about to stop there, but just to roll off, but the challenges still exist. Yeah, I think there's still a lot of challenges and I, I'm looking forward to, to hearing from Kasira and also uh, you know maybe the questions and discussions that we have. Thank right. you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. The, with the, I mean, uh, it's really well supported from our first panelist and also the second uh, panelist. Now it's uh, up to us. What, which one do we want to adopt? What, uh, what type of framework? Whether when the user at the center or the uh, problem or the situation. So, all right. So I think um, let's hear our third uh, panelist. Uh, let's invite our... Dr. Kassera from Semio STEM at uh, Thailand. Pass to you, Doctor. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. And uh, yeah, it it has been nice to hear from uh, Rachel and uh, and Dr. Choi about uh, your perspective to integrated STEM. And uh, my my presentation will uh, yeah uh, reiterate reiterate the importance of of the STEM, whether it's integrated, connected, or uh, uh, yeah, different forms, right? And then I, I would like to propose alternatives that how schools, uh, school leaders, teachers, educators can can work together in helping the student learn uh, to achieve the extended uh, goals that we want to, to see them contributing to so our society. So, uh, I have trouble the going to this the slide, but can can I do like this without blowing up the screen? Let me see. So, yes. yeah, mm. yeah, I I like to uh, share with you that uh, based on the the OECD uh, twenty thirty. Uh, learning uh, framework, which I think it's it's quite a good framework to help us 
revisit that what we expect our students to to achieve in terms of the learning goals and what is the current situation when we when we see many schools uh, implementing uh, stem I, I think i believe that it's uh, the pattern are similar to what Dr. Choi and Dr. Rachel has been uh, mentioning. And I, I would like to propose alternatives, solutions to what we are now doing. When we look at this OECD learning framework, I think it's, it's quite a good framework to help us to realize that because of the rapid uh, changing world, like what we are now facing, right? I think our uh, the kids in the next generation will face even more challenges in the change, uh, the dynamics of the globalizations. So they need they they need more sophisticated skills to cope with that change, unlike our generations, right? The competition will be more because of the mobilization of the workforce, right? The, the problems will be changing quite rapidly, the advanced technology change. And I think in education sector, the way we adapt ourselves to the changing world is not much. I've been in private sector before. I know that they have to change all the time because they're uh, they, they don't have budget, they have to earn income and revenue. So they, they have to compete a great deal, right? But I think in, in higher education, we also have seen a lot of uh, change in terms of decreasing population and young generations that they, uh, they might change their mindset about graduations or earning a degree, right? So when we take a look at the competencies that our young uh, people have to acquire to uh, contribute to the well-being of our uh, planet, our societies, they need to uh, they need to have multiple skill set. They would like to we would like them to be uh, change agent, right? To change the world, we would like them to survive in an unchanging uh, society, mm. and many more right to to work with technology that has been very advancing so we expect a lot from them and uh, in in this learning framework they propose that the schools have to work with the communities work with stakeholders uh, to support this learning experience so that kids can uh, engage in the real world problems like uh, Dr. Rachel and Dr. Choi said. And I think it's very, very crucial that schools should not perceive themselves as a closed unit anymore. They have to work with communities, with stakeholders in order that the problem posed to student is relevant to the real world problem and also relevant to the career uh, uh, opportunity for them so that they can have a higher motivation to succeed in the changing world careers. And the current situations, I think, yeah, it, it, yeah, they, they cover many patterns that uh, both Dr. Shoy and Dr. Rachel has mentioned about the different types of the, the STEM uh, learning experience. But yeah, there might be some countries that start to embed the kind of learning uh, activities that try to promote the cross-cutting concepts, of it, even though it's still within the subject of science, uh, as what we have been aware about the uh, next generation science standards. Uh, and yes, they, they try to think of cross-cutting concepts and uh, focus on the practices and yes, we also seen a lot of engagement by stakeholders in promoting extra curriculum uh, learning activity through problem based or project based learning. And I would like to point to the last uh, idea about how we can 
introduced the career education, career awareness that lay the foundation of how students can acquire the competencies in order that they can advance in their career. And I think when we introduce this mechanism, it's automatically that we have to involve employers in the career education. And by involving external stakeholders, I think education communities can learn a lot about what competencies that employer expect from students. Because uh, if comparing to educators working alone, I think sometimes they cannot uh, imagine that what expect, what competencies that the employers look forward from uh, students, from their employees. And because uh, in many countries, uh, like in Thailand, the advancement of economic growth has been driven by a private sector. And yes, they can, they can transfer the knowledge, transfer the know-how, and also inspire our kids that what the skill set that they need to learn. And when coming to the crowded curriculums, I think the the, the private sector, employment sector maybe can take part that what actually essentials for our young people to succeed because when they recruit staff to work for them, they have to retrain in many areas anyway. Many in-depth skills our education cannot provide anyway because uh, it vary from industry to industry, but what should be the foundation skills that our kids can leverage from uh, this basic skill set so that they can advance in the future when they go to the career. So my proposed alternatives, I would like to share with you uh, the, the re-engineering concept. Corporation has been changing a lot uh, during mm, the past uh, three, four decades. And I would like to raise this re-engineering because I think it's uh, one of the paradigm shift when corporations change their process. For example, in this slide, you will see that when they think about R&D of certain products, before re-engineering, these R&D staff, they work in isolations, right? and they just collect their integrated, their, their separate products to be an integrated products. But after re-engineering, they re-engineer the process in order that the R&D staff work together from the starting point and try to uh, come up with the new products and services that uh, these staff work together in coming up with the product that is more uh, complete right? and then more responsive to the client. Similarly, I think that in the school context, like what uh, uh, Dr. Rachel have been saying, I agree that in education sector, uh, may I say that actually in both the basic education and higher education, uh, I've seen silos of disciplines, right? If we can tear down those silos and let them work together through the leadership and commitment from school leaders or university leaders, and let them work together and focusing more on the competency of student as a holistic uh, manner, in a holistic manner. And, and this has to take into consideration that the core skills should not be neglected. The core skills like literacy and numeracy, these are core uh, competencies that we still observe a big gap in many uh, underserved schools in which students still uh, cannot perform well or underperform. And I believe that uh, if the pre-service institution can prepare the new generation of, uh, of teachers uh, in the way that they work together across disciplines, I think it will help them to 
uh, to become the teachers that we would like to see that they can collaborate with each other. And I think by involving community members and employers, the problems that pose that caused by these uh, stakeholders, it will become integrated uh, manner uh, automatically because when 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 the problem need to be solved, then separate whether it's what discipline, right? So the problem is the uh, the focus of how student can come up with solutions. And at the end, I think the policy makers need to support to support quality learning resources uh, that help students learn better. The assessment, like uh, Dr. Rachel, what you said about how we assess the competencies, uh, which is more challenging than content-based assessment, and the grant support for uh, the, the such projects that promote the problem-based or project-based learning uh, to integrate the, the different disciplines and how to promote the, the model or mechanism that we involve uh, external stakeholders to create the learning experience that more relevant and more meaningful uh, for communities and for their career advancement. So, yeah, right. thank you. Okay, thank you. All right. So, um, uh, now uh, we'll open to a question from the audience. Is there any question? Uh, while waiting for the question, uh, I mean, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, Prof. Rachel, um, you know, like you have mentioned about the difficulty on the assessment, uh, you know, uh, content or the uh, discipline or, you know, uh, just now. So how, how did uh, in Australia they do the, the, the assessment? Uh, I've seen that there's a lot of rubric also being shared just now. So maybe we can a little uh you know uh, share with us a little bit on that um in our curriculum we have the general capabilities and the general capabilities have been um organized in elements and or oh, domains and subdomains and so unlike the transversal competencies which have come out of unesco um which are just words they've actually looked at how students should be progressing along those um, general ca uh, capabilities through those domains and at what level and they should be um, reaching them at what age. However, it's not assessed because it's not reported on. And also um, the general capabilities sit outside of the content areas, so they always belong to somebody else. So maths will do it, art will do it, French will do it, and they don't get done which is a shame because the time and energy spent doing them um, hasn't been really realized, uh, but they are there. And I think into the future, we have to um, mandate that they are included in our assessment. But, you know, then we burden teachers with, so I was talking to a teacher yesterday, she had 300 students to write comments about in a, in a primary space. I mean, that's just normal comments. If you're trying to report on these levels as well, which are contentious, um, it, it's, prob it's problematic. So um, I don't know if you encourage students to self-assess and you um, do some work around that. I think that may be helpful as they get bigger, they, they can um, self-moderate um, and manage themselves. Maybe you get them to work on these, but uh, it's not something that that's done well, but it's something I think we're very, very, um, we really, really need to look into. And and I notice, uh, and Kisera, that's thank you so much, Dr. Kisera, for your for your talk, um, as well. I notice we're all saying the same thing, and it's really heartening to hear that we're all coming towards the same points from different directions. Um, and our, um, and our, our actual um, minutia are different, our, our complexities are different, but the actual, we're all thinking around the same way. And I think that's incredibly heartening that, that, that we're all coming down this pathway together. I think that's, that's going to be very helpful. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rachel. Um, uh, still waiting for other questions. So I'd like to ask um, 
uh, Prof uh, Cho, uh, um, Choi, eh? Singapore has been the uh, number one in PISA or Teams uh, ranking yeah, for mathematics and science. So now I noticed that um, Singapore also planning, uh, you know, to go for 5G. And, and I see that your industrial, uh, in, uh, because I've been following every night at 10 o'clock news about Singapore. So how did all this stem that be able to uh, really flourish the achievement of the students and also the, the country economic, especially related to STEM? Pass to you, Mr. Chai. Okay. That's a very interesting question because I'm not sure whether I got the necessary pay scale to answer the question. <laughs> but I will try my best uh, uh, coming from a, you know, uh, my, my former position in a different uh, capacities. Um, I, I think to begin with, uh, Singapore's uh, achievement in teams and PISA was not an accident. It was actually after many years of uh, you know careful planning and you know, dedication of teachers on the ground, and and we have a quite, I, I would say, quite a coherent curriculum. You know, uh, which, which emphasize uh basics, but at the same time, you know, we move with the times. So just to give you an idea, every six years we we have a curriculum review, so the 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 syllabus is kept up to date. You know, in in some sense, but at the same time, we also don't try to change too much. Uh. Because there are some important skills that that is needed, you know, uh, at the at the basic level, but what we are trying to do here is to encourage teachers to start looking at connections, looking at you know, uh, STEM in a more integrated manner. So there's autonomy and support given to some schools. Uh, in fact, most of the schools will have some of this uh, support to to implement STEM programs. So in, in, in relation to one of the questions asked just now, you know, whether there's co-teaching in Singapore schools, the answer is yes. You know, uh, some of the schools uh, have what we call STEM programs that they, they kind of initiate on their own and they have the support of the leadership, the school leadership, you know, to, to, to run some of these programs. Of course, we have quite specialized STEM schools. If you want to call it STEM schools, we, we do have what we call specialized STEM schools. Uh, they are actually not STEM schools. Uh, in the US kind of sense, uh, but they, they are specialized in some area because they are independent schools. Uh, by independent means uh, they are free to uh, carve out their own curriculum. You know, so they, they have some restrictions, but you know, they, they have relative, uh, uh, relatively more freedom to do so. So in, in some way, we kind of let a thousand flowers bloom. <laughs> you know, if you understand that phrase, you know, uh, we, we have different pockets of ground up initiatives uh, you know from schools and what the the ministry is is, uh, is supporting is in terms of funding is in terms of uh, expertise uh, and uh, in, in terms of making being a matchmaker you know <laughs> if this school want to do some of these programs well we're going to find someone who who is a, a expert in this and then uh, you know match meet the schools so that things can happen and sometimes we even find industry partners so that there are different uh policies that different programs all happening at the same time and uh and sometimes they just flow in a in a in a similar direction but slowly i don't think it's a it's a fast change yeah, and things like you. that right yeah. thank you Prof. Choi. all right so uh, dr uh Kessera, um you talk about um a lot on leadership and the mindset so yes. uh, how how did yeah from let like, semio role I know to to on this uh, towards a stem. Pass to you, yeah. Dr. Kasera. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you. Yes, I think yeah, mindset uh, shifting is is the first step right to any change process. And I think for teachers and educator to uh, to be aware that how stem is crucial for 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 student future careers. Right. So I think. Organizing an event uh, uh, in a way that employers can share with teachers, educators that what skills are very crucial <laughs> for our uh, for our future, and let them share that the student where they accept now, recruit now, what is the gap, <laughs> right? And or even do conducting an externship 
in order that our teachers can uh, can visit uh, factories, right, uh, site, so, so that they learn from the real world experience that how existing workers work, how they solve problems, right? So I think providing an experience for our educators uh, is very crucial to them for them to understand the real world experience. Yeah. Thank you. Right. That's so it. I think to sum up. Uh, Dr. Yes, Narani, uh, could I have a verbal question, please? Uh, yes, please. Yes. Uh, yes, yes. This is addressed to uh, any of the panelists, uh, probably uh, Prof. Uh, Rachel. Okay, I'm I'm from a rural-based school in the Sarawak. My question is: uh, with all these ten things, we are having a, a challenge in the sense that uh, when you give a project or an assignment to our students, we are too confined with a preset uh, answer and solution. In in where we are we are governed by some uh, kind of model answers. So what is your view on that? Uh, uh, on, should we still continue with this uh, preset answer module? Uh, in, uh, uh, with the permission, uh, dengan izin, uh, contoh jawapan, module jawapan. So I think this is uh, uh, not in line with the real uh, solutions. We are running of time now. So I think I'll pass to the, uh, Prof. Rachel. Is it a Thank good you. way for model yeah. answer, especially for the rural area, so that they be That's able right. to to do well in their performance. Pass to you, Dr. Thank you. Thank well, you. I'd have to, I'd have to argue you have to change the assessment. And, and no disrespect to my colleague in Singapore, but they write the tests, so they should be good at it. <laughs> Which <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I think that some of the students, um, they are the best and most creative in rural areas. They're problem solvers from an early age. They have to be. And they're often really awesome at it. So I would persevere with encouraging that creativity and that critical thinking. And I know I'm on a tight time scram, so I'll stop there. But I think it's so important. And I think you, you, you persevere. I really do. Because for me, that's value. That's about solving real problems rather than just regurgitating facts and, 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 uh, and data information. Yes, yes. So I, I think um, next time we should have three hours instead of Absolutely. one hour. Yeah. Because there's a lot of interesting issue from different mm -hmm. different uh, perspective that we have been talking here. Assessment, definitely, because assessment that gear and, and, and then guide our pedagogy and our, our, our way of teaching, yeah? And also must be supported by the uh, leaders uh, either in the school or policy makers. So there's a lot of issues here. Maybe we will uh, can uh, maybe Prof. Laili, the organizer of IC STEM today, will organize a three hours forum. We'll be more <laughs> time to, to talk. Okay. So I think uh, without further ado, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Rachel, uh, Prof. Choi, and Dr. Kasera for all your great sharing and lovely, and also all the audience. So thank you very much. We're looking forward for you for further collaboration in other occasion. So with that, thank you very much and pass to you back our MC. Thank you. Thank you. MC, pass to you back. Thank you, Thank you to, to Professor, Professor Dr. Dr. Noraini, Assistant Professor Dr. Choi, Dr. Kesara, and Associate Professor Dr. Rachel for the fruitful forum. With all the honorable guests here with us today, let us all cherish the moment by taking photos together. All guests are invited to switch on your camera for the photography session.
In count of one to twenty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. Nineteen and twenty. Uh, one last shot, freestyle. The closing ceremony will begin shortly. I seek your attention to stay in the WebEx platform for the closing ceremony. Thank you.